Hi everyone, this is chapter nine, behavior therapy. So before we proceed on, I just want you to know that there are links throughout this PowerPoint. So during the lecture, if uh, we have one, I will mention it and I hope that you will pause this lecture and then click on the link and then watch the video. Uh, most of the time, the videos will explain a specific concept in an interesting way that will help you memorize it or understand it a little bit better. All right, so let's proceed forward uh, with this chapter. So behavior therapy uh, focuses on directly observable behavior. So observable behaviors are things that you can see, feel, you know, through your senses and stuff like that. Current determinants of behavior. So current reasons why you are behaving the way that you're behaving. Learning experiences that promote change, tailoring treatment strategies to individual clients and rigorous assessment and evaluation. So the key word there is rigorous because there's a lot of data that has uh, been used to really make sure that behavior therapy is something that everyone can believe is effective. When you have a lot of data and a lot of analysis that proves it, you know, more people tend to go, yeah, this is a trustworthy therapeutic framework, we will use it. And you'll see how uh, insurance companies will uh, talk a lot about behavior therapy or, or CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the next chapter, because it is so data driven. Here is a list of different types of uh, areas where behavior therapy is used quite a bit. I'm not going to sit here and read through it. Feel free to pause and then observe, but you know, it kind of works almost in every field. Okay, let's talk about historical backgrounds. In the 1950s and 60s, behavioral therapy was very popular in the U.S., South Africa, and Britain. Classical and operant conditioning for treatment was very well known during this time. Behavior therapy is uh, currently associated with other evidence-based techniques. So what that is basically saying is behavior therapy started out really popular and then it emerged and it branched out, just like we talked about Freud branching out to Adlerian therapy and so forth and so on. Same thing happened with behavior therapy. So when we talk about that, we're talking about cognitive therapy, social skills training, relaxation training, and then mindfulness strategies. Bandura, which is one of the famous people in this field, uh, talked about social learning theory, which is classical and operant conditioning with observational learning, which means watching other people do things. So you can see the social aspect of that. Cognitive behavioral approaches focuses on cognitive representations of the environment as opposed to objective environment. So remember how we talk about subjective and objective? Subjective is more of a person's point of view. So cognitive behavioral approaches focuses more on the subjective than just the objective environment. Offered as an alternative to psychoanalytic psychotherapies. So uh, if you were not a Freudian or someone of a neo-Freudian type, you would use uh, behavioral therapy. In the 1980s, more attention was given to the emotions and therapeutic change and biological factors and psychological disorders. So what I was talking a little bit about is, you know, uh, our behaviors aren't just so cold. Maybe there's a reason why. There's an emotional aspect or a feeling aspect that is associated with the way that we behave. And so behavior started off uh, focusing quite a lot on behavior, but then also wanted to understand a little bit more about, you know, the feelings and stuff like that that are associated with humans and stuff like that. So we talk about the continued emergence of cognitive behavioral therapy because we wanted to know more about the feeling aspect of it. And then two is the application of behavioral techniques to the prevention and treatment of health related disorders. A lot of people who work in the field of um, schools uh, tend to work in a behavioral or cognitive behavioral aspect because it's about m behavior modification. Okay, so uh, let's say a person with autism, if they're throwing tantrums, how do we work with this disorder? In the 2000s, uh, behavioral therapy uh, branched out to dialectical behavior therapy. There's also mindfulness based stress reduction mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, these words and concepts might seem a little crazy right now or foreign to you. However, we'll discuss it at the later end of this chapter. Okay, there are four areas of development uh, that we want to talk about first is classical conditioning, operant conditioning, social cognitive theory, and cognitive behavior therapy. So on this slide right here, you'll see the classical conditioning with uh, the dog. So I'll explain that as we go along as well um, when we go into each section of these uh, areas of development. Okay, classical conditioning. What happens prior to learning that creates a response through pairing? So the pairing is a key word right there. Pair is basically two things put together, becomes a pair or a couple basically, right? So that's what we're talking about. 
So the most famous is Ivan Pavlov and experiments with his dogs. Uh, he basically placed food in a dog's mouth, which leads to the dog salivating. Okay, when the food is repeatedly presented with some originally neutral stimulus, neutral stimulus means that the stimulus actually doesn't cause anything. Okay, so like the sound of a bell. So when he presented, uh, let's say, food with the sound of the bell, the dog will eventually salivate to the sound of just the bell alone. If the bell is sounded repeatedly but does not get paired with the food, the salivation response will eventually diminish and then become extinct. Okay, so again, let's really recap this really quickly. Food makes the dog salivate. Okay, every time you give the dog food, you also ring a bell. So the dog hears that bell and as associates that or pairs it with food. So even though when you have no food and you just ring the bell, the dog is going to automatically assume that food is going to come with it and it'll start to salivate. However, if you do it, uh, ring the bell all the time and you don't present the food, the dog will go, you know what, I'm not associating this bell sound with the food anymore, so it's going to become extinct. Operant conditioning is learning in which behaviors are influenced mainly by the consequences that follow them. If the environmental changes brought about by the behavior are reinforcing, which basically means provide some sort of reward or eliminate some adversive stimuli, adversive basically means something that one does not like, the chances are increased that the behavior will occur again. So a part of uh, operant conditioning that's associated, the key terms that are associated with operant conditioning is positive and negative reinforcement, punishment, and extinction. Social learning approach, uh, there's interactional, interdisciplinary, and multimodal. So you can see right there that it's a lot of things working together in kind of like a system, okay? Both classical and operant conditioning models does not consider the thinking process, attitudes, and values. Uh, but however, in social learning approach, you're going to involve these three things or this triadic thing, uh, reciprocal interactions among the environment, the personal factors, so that means the beliefs, the preferences, the expectations, or self-perceptions and interpretations, but then also that person's individual behavior. And it's a combination of those three things working together in a system. Uh, environmental events on behavior are mainly determined by cognitive processing governing how influent or environmental influences are perceived by a person and how these events are interpreted. People are capable of self-directed behavior change and that the person in the, uh, is the agent of change. So what that is basically saying is that in behavior therapy, we really believe that the client is the person who does all the changes. So they are the agent of change or the one who causes the change. Sorry, there is some sort of helicopter flying by. Self-efficacy uh, associated with Bandura is each person's belief or expectation that he or she can master a situation and bring about desired change. So when someone says, I think I can do it, um, that means that they have self-efficacy. And, and in Bandura, what they're saying is when you watch someone model a conversation, let's say, right? Um, then you ask your client, can you also do that? The client will go, you know what, I think I can do that because I've watched two people do it and now I think I'm going to try and do it as well, but I think I should be able to do it. That means that person has self-efficacy. Example is ways people can develop effective social skills after they are in contact with other people who effectively model interpersonal skills, which is what I basically just said. Okay, Cognitive Behavior Therapy, CBT, will be discussed at length in the next chapter because it is one of the most popular therapeutic frameworks that uh, exists at the current time. It's contemporary behavioral therapy, what people believe influences how they act and feel. Before, we were just focusing on acting, right? Not necessarily about the feelings, but CBT includes the feeling part to it. In the 1970s, CBT basically replaced behavior therapy because people want to also uh, associate the feeling component as well. Both is change in, uh, or changes both cognitive and behavioral, okay? Modifying thoughts to change the behaviors and then altering external factors that lead to the behavior change. So there's that feeling and then the acting happening at the same time. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the key concepts of view on human nature. It's systematic. Remember, we're talking about systems that are working together. It's structured, so there's um, a certain way that things happen. Um, that is an approach to counseling when it comes to behavioral uh, therapy. 
does not rest on a deterministic assumption that humans are a product of their social cultural conditioning. So remember how in Freud, it is deterministic. Things that happen when you're younger has determined who you will be in the in adulthood. And this one, it says it does not believe in that and that anyone can change at any time. We are not stuck with uh, what had happened when we're younger now as an adult. It's contemporary. A person is a producer and the product of his or her environment. Remember the agent of change that we were talking about before. Give control to clients and increase their range of freedom and increase people's skills so that they have more options for responding. Okay, we're talking about basic characteristics and assumptions now. Number one, behavioral therapy is based on the principles and procedures of the scientific method. So the scientific method, again, is data-driven. Uh, we are gonna mark down everything that we observe when it comes to the specific behavior, and then we'll analyze it. And then we'll analyze the progress or maybe no progress when it comes to a specific person. But either way, the scientific method is explained much more in detail in the textbook. Please feel free to read into it if you're not familiar with the scientific method. Two, behavior is not limited to overt actions a person engages in that we can observe. Behavior also includes internal processes such as cognitions, images, beliefs, and emotions. So what that is also saying is it's not just about the, the actions that happen, but there's also probably an underlying uh, underlining uh, tone to the whole thing as well. And we wanna know what that component is. Three, Behavior therapy deals with the client's current problems and the factors influencing them, as opposed to analysis of possible historical determinants. Functional assessment of behavioral analysis is client-produced behavior change by changing the environmental events. So let's break this down because it might be a little bit complicated. Behavioral therapy deals with the client's current problems and the factors influencing, as opposed to the analysis of a possible historical determinant. So what, again, that says is that we're talking about what's happening right now, not necessarily things that happened when they were younger that causes them to do the things that they do now. It's more like, you know, what are some of the things that trigger this person's behavior? Functional assessment or behavioral analysis is basically uh, when you first meet that person, you're going to try and understand as much as possible about these actions that they're having or these behaviors that they're having and then understand what happens before, what happens afterwards. So you really understand this person uh, so that you understand that there are components that might affect uh, that person's behavior that is in, in the environment. Four, clients involved in behavior therapy are expected to assume an active role by engaging in specific actions to deal with their problems. So they're going to monitor themselves and they're also going to do homework. So let's say that we meet maybe once a week with your client. Um, what happens with the other six days of the week? Instead, they have to actually monitor them themselves. And then when they come in for counseling or for, for a session with you, you can analyze what has happened. It's not just happening only that one hour with the therapist. It means that they're doing it outside uh, so that they can um, then uh, basically, mm, uh, you know, do these behaviors that they want uh, outside of therapy. This approach, number five, assumes that change can take place without insight into underlying dynamics and without understanding the origins of the psychological problem. So change can happen and you might not necessarily need to know what the origins of the problem was. Six, assessment is an ongoing process of observation and self-monitoring that focuses on the current determinants of the behavior, including identifying the problem and evaluating the change. Assessment informs the treatment process. Culture is part of the social environment. So again, we're talking about um, basically being able to monitor yourself and understanding what's going on. Um, and then also knowing that uh, when you understand that person, you'll see the different components that causes this person to behave in the way that they behave. Seven behavioral treatment interventions are individually tailored to specific problems experienced by the client. What treatment, by whom, in what uh, is what is the most effective for this individual with the specific problem and under which set of circumstances. So what that basically means is that each person is a unique individual, so their goals are gonna be different than the next person. There's not gonna be the exact same thing. It's not cookie cutter, okay? So it'll be unique to that specific individual. The therapeutic process and therapeutic goals increase personal choice and to create new conditions for learning. Formal assessment takes place prior to treatment to determine behaviors that are target for change. Important to devise a way to measure progress towards goals and based on empirical validation. Uh, 
and goals must be clear, concrete, understood, agreed upon by the client and the counselor. So in therapy, the person is going to learn about different ways to behave. And then you are going to allow that person then to choose what ones they feel comfortable doing um, when it comes to whatever behavior they need to change. They'll also understand who they are in, uh, you know, by understand, talking to them and understanding the triggers or things that happened before and after, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about called antecedents and consequences. Um, and then from there, we can then modify things so that their behavior does change to a more positive way. And also uh, monitoring them. So it might be some sort of checklist. Let's say uh, uh, a person is throwing a tantrum. First week before any interventions are given to this person, they are throwing 50 tantrums a week. So there's a check, you know, a little check thing. So anytime that client throws a tantrum, you mark it off. And then week two, maybe the interventions are quite frightening for that child because uh, they're afraid of change. So it goes to 100. But, you know, it doesn't, it's, it's not bad. Sometimes it goes, it gets worse before it gets better. So um, then the week three, it might be down to 40. And then week six or seven, it'll be 25. And then you can monitor the progress or the non-progress of that specific person. Okay. And then writing a, a treatment plan, it needs to be very clear and understood by anyone. The therapist's function and role. Functional assessment, behavioral analysis, again, that's basically understanding that, comp uh, that person in a complete way. Identifying the maintaining uh, conditions by systematically gathering information about the ABC model. So the A stands for antecedents, uh, things that are happening beforehand. Problem behavior is B, and then consequences is C. So antecedents is anything, uh, any events that elicit a certain behavior. So things that will cause another behavior. So an example would be a client who has trouble going to sleep. That would be the problem behavior. Listening to relaxation tapes may serve as a cue for sleep induction. So that would be an antecedent, okay? Or turning off the lights or removing the television from the bedroom, these are things that will elicit uh, the behavior that you want, right? So we wanna change those antecedents to things that you want. Um, if it was before you keep the lights on, it's not gonna help you fall asleep because it's so bright inside the room. Consequences, again, events that maintain a behavior in some way, either by increasing or decreasing. So that's what happens afterwards. Does it continue to happen or is it going to reduce or is it going to increase depending on what the change is that you want? Um, it could be any of those things. Example would be client may be more likely to return to counseling after the counselor offers verbal praise or encouragement for having come in and for having completed the homework. So that praise causes that person to feel good. That feeling, that feeling of being good uh, is a consequence. So they're going to continue to do those things because it feels good. A client may also be less likely to return to counseling if the counselor is consistently late to sessions. So if that is the behavior, you don't feel good, you feel like maybe your counselor's not really interested in you, and then you're not gonna continue. So that would be the consequence of, of those actions that are happening. A behavioral assessment interview identifies a particular antecedent and consequent events that influence a person's behavior. So again, that's just a conversation with the client to understand the person uh, and their situation. And then from there, you're going to notice these things. So it's basically just an interview, or it could also be a survey of some sort, a behavioral survey asking you what you do throughout the day. Maybe you'll notice something as a therapist that the client did not know that causes or triggers a specific behavior that they don't want. An example would be a client comes in to reduce anxiety, which prevents her from leaving the home. So as a therapist, you're going to ask how she experiences the anxiety of leaving her house. So what did you actually do in this situation? So it might be, tell me what happens when you wake up in the morning. Gathers in, uh, additional information about this anxiety. When did the problem begin? In what situation does it arise? What does she do at these times? What are her feelings and thoughts in the situation? Who is present when she experiences anxiety? Uh, what does she do to reduce anxiety? And how do you, uh, how do her present fears interfere with her living effectively? Okay. Uh, specific behavioral goals are developed in strategies such as relaxation training, 
systematic desensitization and exposure therapy are designed to help the client reduce her anxiety to a manageable level. Again, we talk about the fact that anxiety is a good thing. We all should have anxiety because it does protect us and it keeps us on our toes. However, people who are always high anxiety, that's not healthy for them. It's exhausting. So we want to bring it down to a much more manageable level that typical people will have. Clients experience in therapy. Therapist's role is to teach the concrete skills through provision of instructions, modeling, and performance feedback. So instructions is, here, this is what you're supposed to do. Modeling is, watch me do this. And then uh, performance is, now you as a client, you do it, and then I'm going to let you know what you did good and what needs to be improved. Client engages in behavioral rehearsal with feedback until the skills are well learned and generally receive active homework assignments. Clients are encouraged to experiment for the purpose of enlarging their repertoire of adaptive behaviors. So now that you're aware that there's other ways to act, let's practice them so that you feel comfortable. And when you feel comfortable, you'll be able to use it in the real world. Counseling is not complete unless action follows verbalization. And what that basically you say is a lot of people always say, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, but they never really actually do it. So in behavior therapy, it's not really effective until the client actually starts to do what they say they're going to do. Application techniques uh, and procedures. Hallmark in the behavioral approaches is that the therapeutic techniques are empirically supported and evidence-based practice is highly valued. Again, very data-driven. Lots of people have done research in these areas and it has been shown that it is effective most of the times that it has been uh, uh, applied to people which is why, again, behavior therapy, CBT, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy are so popular because um, there is actual scientific proof that these things actually do work, okay? So here's a list of things that we're actually now gonna start covering, and these are the different techniques when it comes to behavioral therapy. There is applied behavioral analysis, which is operant conditioning techniques, this progressive muscle relaxation, systematic desensitization, in vivo exposure and flooding, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, social skills training, self-management programs and self-directed behavior, multimodal therapy, clinical behavioral therapy, and mindfulness and acceptance-based cognitive behavioral therapy. I know it sounds really scary, but as we break down these, um, these different uh, techniques, uh, you'll see how actually they're very easy to apply to uh, therapy. All right, so let's talk about the first one, applied behavioral analysis, operant conditioning techniques. So uh, when we talk about operant, we talked a little bit about positive and negative earlier. And I want to stress that positive and negative do not mean good and bad in this sense. Positive means to add, negative means to take away, okay? Just remember one is to add and one is to take away. So in positive reinforcement, you're going to add reinforcement, okay? So addition of something of value to the individual. It could be praise, attention, money, food, as a consequence of a behavior. The stimulus that follows the behavior is a positive reinforcement. So example, a child earns excellent grades and is praised for studying by her parents. So if she loves praise or she values praise, it's likely that she will get excellent grades in the future because it makes her feel good that her parents praise her because she likes it. However, if she does not like praise, it would not be considered a reinforcer. So you cannot automatically assume that praise is something that everyone wants. You need to know that client and understand what they like. So you need to talk to them, right? Uh, here's another example. Sometimes we tend to give gifts like candy, like chocolates to a person as a reward, right? But there are people in this world, believe it or not, that don't like chocolate. They actually hate chocolate. So when they do something good, let's say get good grace and you give them chocolate, they're like, ew, I don't want this chocolate. Why are you punishing me, right? So what one person might see as an award or reward or positive reinforcement actually could be seen as a punishment for another. So you really do need to know the situation uh, and the person before you proceed forward with positive reinforcement. Okay, let's talk about negative reinforcement now. Uh, negative says take away, okay? So escape from or avoidance of adversive or unpleasant stimuli. 
The person is motivated to exhibit a desired behavior to avoid the unpleasant condition. So example is a friend of mine does not appreciate waking up to the shrill sound of an alarm clock. So she has trained herself to wake up five, or, you know, a couple minutes before the alarm sounds to avoid the adversive stimulus of the alarm buzzer. So you're taking away something that they don't like to increase a positive behavior, okay, a good behavior. So another example would be chores. Let's say that uh, I hate doing my chores. So my parent goes, if you do good work, like let's say get an A, you do not have to do chores for this week. So you're taking away something that I don't like so that I increase a specific behavior that is considered good. Okay, negative reinforce is taking away something that the person doesn't like to increase something that you want them to do. Okay, so again, I hate chores. So my parents say, if you get good grades, I take away the chores that you don't like for a week, and that's like a reward for you. Okay, so negative and positive reinforcement are good things that encourage or increase a certain behavior. Remember that. Extinction, which we heard a little bit about before with Pavlov, withholding and reinforcement from a previously uh, reinforced response. Extinction can be used for behaviors that have been maintained by positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement. Okay, so stop your uh, lecture here and then click on this video, this link, uh, children who display temper tantrums, and then we'll come back and then we'll discuss it. All right, um, for once now that you have seen the video, parents reinforce this behavior by the attention that they give to the child. So the child isn't really in pain because the child stops whenever the child knows that the parent is no longer looking. So it's like, oh, I'm fine, but I do want attention from my parents. So I'm gonna scream because I know that screaming really loud will get people's attention and I just need some attention. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to, as a parent, make them stop doing this. So you're gonna ignore it. And the reason why you would ignore it is because the child goes, okay, I am screaming because I want my parents to hang out with me, right? But if my parents ignore me and, you know, are saying, oh, it's not a big deal, you know, whatever, then I'm gonna try and scream louder. So they might scream even louder just to get the parents' uh, attention. But the parent goes, you know what? I know what you're trying to do. I'm going to keep on ignoring you. So then the child goes, you know what? I've been screaming for a really long time and my parents are not giving me attention. I'm tired. So I'm going to stop this. I'm going to maybe try some other alternative to get my parents' attention. Maybe I need to be quiet and play by myself for a little bit. And then my parents will come over and talk to me. Okay, so again, right there is understanding how uh, to monitor or control a person. Okay, if you ignore them, they're not going to do it anymore after a while because you know, they realize, oh, this is not going to work. So the behavior in this video is a tantrum and positive reinforcement for the child is the attention. No matter how much you think that uh, screaming is annoying for that child, they're going to go, I scream, you hold me. You know, and that's what I want. I want someone to hold me right now. Parents use extinction when uh, during and, and after a child's temper tantrum. T uh, parents ignore the child's tantrum related behaviors. Again, once they ignore it enough, the child will learn that this is not getting them what they want. So they're going to try something else. Sometimes extinction can result in anger and aggression because it's very frustrating. Uh, sometimes when you initially use extinction, the unwanted behaviors may increase temporarily. So again, like I said before, maybe the child's screaming at a level five, they're gonna go, oh yeah, you're ignoring me now. I'm gonna scream at a level 10. So they'll start screaming really, really loudly. And then you're still ignoring them. They're like, I'm exhausted. And then they might go back to a five, and then a four, a three, a one, and then maybe not even scream at all because they realize, you know what, this is not getting them what they want. Punishment is also known as adversive control. Adversive is things that you don't like or someone, something that one does not uh, want. Uh, the consequence of a certain behavior results in a decrease of that behavior. Goal of punishment is to decrease a target behavior. There are two different types, again, positive and negative punishment. One is to give something to this person or add to this thing, and one is to take away. So positive punishment is an aversive stimulus is added after the behavior to decrease the frequency of a behavior. So you might give or add time out to a child because of their misbehavior, okay? 
negative punishment if stimulus is removed following the behavior to decrease the frequency of a target behavior. So let's say that you're late to work all the time because we don't want you to be late anymore. We're going to take your money because you love money, right? And you, do you want me to take your money? No. So by doing that, you're going to then not be late anymore. Another example would be a speeding ticket, right? So you're speeding, you're going 100 miles an hour, and then the police uh, officer pulls you over and gives you a $300 ticket. That was a lot of money. You'll pay it because you're a good citizen, but afterwards you're not going to probably speed anymore because you're like, oh, I got caught once and I lost $300. I want to lose another $300. I could buy some coffee, you know? So then you're going to behave and obey the law. Some practitioners are opposed to punishment. Actually, it's a very, uh, many, many people are opposed to punishment. Uh, they recommend substituting with positive reinforcement instead. So instead of punishing them, you wanna get to know that person and find out what they like and then reward them with those things that they like. Um, there has been research that says that countries that punish a lot produce people who are very aggressive uh, and very angry and mean. And we don't want mean people in this world. We want good, happy people in this world. So instead of punishing them, why don't we, you know, praise them, uh, value them instead? Okay, because that's, that's good. Anyways, uh, the key principle is use the least adversive means possible to change behavior. And positive reinforcement is known to be the most powerful change agent. Again, the research says that positive reinforcement is good and the best way to deal with change. Okay, progressive muscle relaxation is associated with Jacobson. Um, achieving muscle and mental relaxation is very difficult for some people because we don't really learn it. Uh, but it is easy to learn, we just don't bother with it because we think it's so easy. Essential that clients practice these exercises daily to uh, obtain maximum results. So the key word there is daily. We want them to do it all the time because they have, let's say, high anxiety or they're going to throw tantrums. But if we relax them, they're not necessarily going to be as likely to do it all the time. Uh, deep and regular breathing. Believe it or not, some of us don't know how to breathe very well. Clients learn to mentally let go of things, problematic stuff, let go of it. Feel and experience the tension building up. Know the difference between a tense and relaxed state. Sometimes you're walking around and people go, wow, you look really tense. And you're like, really? I am? That's because you're not even aware that you are being very tense right now. So right now, uh, here is a link and it's for chair yoga. So you do not have to stand up or anything. You just sit there. You do some different various breathing techniques and movement techniques. So please stop and watch this video and participate in the video. Do it. Okay. Um, if you're not willing to do this, how are you expecting your own clients to do it? Right? So if I was uh, lecturing this in class, I would make the entire class do it. And I would point out people who uh, were not participating because um, that's not the point of counseling, right? You to be enthusiastic and be a team player. Systematic desensitization, uh, Joseph Wolpe, based on classical conditioning, clients imagine successively more anxiety arousing situations at the same time that they engage in a behavior that competes with anxiety. Gradually, clients become less sensitive to the anxiety arousing situation. So part of this is relaxation techniques, but then also uh, uh, confronting that person with small steps that are kind of scary, baby scary stuff, and then all the way up to super scary stuff. So let's say that it's a spider that that person is scared of. We might start off with a picture of a spider, and then the last thing is might be touching a spider. Okay, so the, again, there's a systematic way to do this, um, also known as systematic desensitization. This link is a wonderful link um, where they talk about a woman who is actually afraid of tarantulas or spiders. So uh, please stop this lecture now and watch this because it goes through every step. And it's really interesting to see how, and hopefully you can pick up some tips to uh, do this if you need to with a future client. In vivo exposure and flooding. So exposure therapies is basically treating fears and other negative emotional responses by introducing clients to situations that contribute to such problems. But of course, it's going to be in a very carefully controlled condition. So remember when we were talking about the podcast, um, that was a very controlled room with that doctor or that uh, psychologist, I'm sorry, uh, with the knife. So um, 
you want to make sure that this is a safe space for them to actually do those things that for them they find very scary. Um, it could also be through imagination or it could be in vivo, which basically means in real life. So in vivo, client exposure to the actual anxiety evoking events rather than simply imagining these situations. Functional analysis of the objects or situations a person avoids or fears, and the therapist and client generate a hierarchy of situations for the client to encounter in ascending order of difficulty. So what we were talking about before with the previous systematic desensitization, that's what we're talking about, right? You're going to find a scary, like baby scary stuff, and then super scary stuff at the end and maybe 10 steps and you work on step one and then you slowly go towards step 10. Flooding is another one uh, when it comes to exposure is uh, either in vivo or imaginal exposure to anxiety evoking stimuli for a prolonged period of time. So you're going to flood them at one time with this sensation that causes a lot of anxiety. Even though the client experiences anxiety, the fear consequences do not occur. Um, I'll give you an example. It's like, I am afraid of elevators, let's say, right? So you and the client will go into an elevator and ride the elevator up and down for about an hour. You know, so we beforehand, we probably talk a little bit about what the fears are with elevators. It might break, you might fall down, you might get stuck in there. But most elevators, it really doesn't happen, right? So as a person is in there for that long, their anxiety will go down because they're going, oh, wait a minute, it's not going to break. It's not, I'm not going to fall to the, you know, to my death or anything like that. Hopefully that won't happen. Um, but yeah, so you'll realize that those fears that you have are actually quite silly uh, and over uh, exaggerated. Okay, in vivo flooding. Again, we just talked a little bit about the elevator. Intense and prolonged exposure to the actual anxiety producing stimuli. Remaining exposed to fear stimuli for a prolonged period without engaging in any anxiety reducing behaviors allow the anxiety to decrease on its own. Because that person is riding in the elevator like, oh, wait a minute, it's actually not happening. Actually, I'm riding the elevator. It's been an hour. Nothing has happened. I'm okay. Imaginal flooding is similar to in vivo, but occurs in the client's imagination. And there's reasons why we want to do imagination because of certain situations such as experiencing sexual violence or rape. Uh, that's not something you want that person to be exposed to several times to help them get through it, right? Instead, that one experience that they've experienced, um, they can deal with it that way. So if you want to stop here, there is a wonderful uh, little clip about a therapist who deals with imaginal flooding and sexual violence. Exposure therapies are the single most potent behavioral procedure available for anxiety related disorders and has long lasting effects. So in the research and the data, it says that uh, exposure therapies are really effective in reducing anxiety because you're confronting those anxieties face on. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or EMDR. Uh, again, there is a video right here that talks a little bit about people who go through EMDR and how they uh, feel much better. Okay, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, uh, exposure therapy that entails assessment and preparations, again, getting to know this person, imaginal flooding, and then cognitive restructuring. So uh, fixing those feelings that they have or changing the way that they feel in the treatment of individuals with traumatic memories. Uh, one thing I will say is that EMDR is actually quite popular in the military uh, because uh, there's people who have anxiety, PTSD, and stuff like that. And it says that EMDR actually works really well when it comes to uh, those types of uh, challenges or barriers. Use of ryth uh, rapid rhythmic uh, eye movements and other bilateral simulation to create to treat clients who have experienced traumatic stress. Again, EMDR is very popular with PTSD. And I'll let you know something at Cal State LA, uh, there is someone who is an expert in this in the counseling center. All right, social skills training. Individuals available to interact effectively with others in various social situations. So we're talking about learning how to socialize or interact with other people. To develop and achieve skills in interpersonal competence. Social skills involve being able to communicate with other people in an effective and appropriate way. You can do that through psychoeducation, learning, modeling, which is watching two people do it or 
three year people, you know, whatever it is, socializing. And then there's behavioral rehearsal, which means that the client themselves are actually going to try it out. And feedback is when the client tries it out. How can we offer them additional constructive criticism so that they can be the best that they can be when it comes to socialization? There's assessment. Uh, direct instructions and coaching, modeling, role playing, and homework assignments. Uh, part of this would be anger management training. Is about that. Is you know going through how to control your anger uh, through watching other people deal with it, or learning how to through reading or whatever it is uh, that uh, we just talked about. Assertion training is the other way, instead of not uh, uh, anger management, it's difficulty expressing anger or irritation. So there's, you know, some people who just cannot verbalize how upset they are, um, or there are people who have a difficulty saying no, who are overly polite and allow others to take advantage of them, who find it difficult to express affection and other positive responses, who feel... Uh, who feel that they do not have a right to express their thoughts, beliefs, and feelings, who have social phobias, uh, and stuff like that. So it would be these areas, um, uh, these, these challenges that you would do assertion training. People have the right but not the obligation to express themselves. Uh, so what we're saying is, you know, uh, if you don't want someone to bother you, you have the right to ignore it or you have the right to say it, right? But some people don't know how to say it. So we're going to give them that option so they have both and then they can choose whether or not they want to address the problem. The goal is to increase a person's repertoire so that they can make the choice of whether to be assertive. And there's a difference between being aggressive and assertive, okay? Aggressive is demanding things without caring about the other person that you're demanding the things from. So it's like, give that to me. Right. As opposed to someone who is assertive, which is, please give this to me. Thank you very much. You are treating that other person as an actual human being and you respect them. OK, you're caring about how they feel. One is just demanding and taking and the other one is getting what you want, uh, but through a more sophisticated uh, way. Why is it good in individual or group therapy? Uh, again, the individual, it's fine because we've been talking about an individual approach, but group is wonderful as well because there's so many people that that person can now try the different ways of interacting with different people. Self-management programs and self-directed behavior. Um, this is when a person's going to monitor themselves. So we're talking about self-monitoring, self-reward. So whenever you reach a specific goal, you reward yourself. Maybe you really love Disneyland. You're going to treat yourself to Disneyland. Uh, Self-contracting, which is basically making yourself uh, your treatment plan and making sure you understand what's going on. And then stimulus control. So you're understanding what's going on around you and how you are uh, adding things to make uh, those behavioral changes. Change can be brought about by teaching people to use coping skills in problematic situations and encouraging clients to accept the responsibility for carrying out these strategies in daily life. Again, the huge part about behavioral change is to be able to do it in your real life, not just in counseling uh, in a session, but to actually apply them into the real world that you live in. So let's talk a little bit about properly uh, doing a treatment plan, because that can be very uh, confusing for some people. Number one is uh, selecting the goal. Establish one at a time, measurable, attainable, positive, and significant for you. So you really need to find a goal that, uh, or the client needs to find a goal that they really want to achieve, okay? And you as a therapist will talk to them, and then you guys will agree upon uh, one goal or two goals to work on during uh, counseling. Two, translating goals into target behaviors, uh, identifying behaviors targeted for change, anticipate obstacles and ways to, uh, to negotiate them. So what that is saying is now, now we have a big overlying goal. So what are the things that we need to do to actually achieve that goal? So it'll be kind of like the baby steps, okay? So you're gonna talk about those things and then also talk about, hey, what happens if one of these behaviors actually doesn't really work? Then you can say, no, it's okay, we tried it. Let's try it and add something else and replace it so that maybe that new thing will help them achieve that goal. Three is self-monitoring. It's deliberately observe your own behavior and keep a behavioral diary with comments about antecedents and consequences. So an excellent one is, an ex excellent example would be kind of like a food diary of trying to lose weight. Then you're gonna write about how it feels, you know, uh, before, let's say you're feeling a little groggy and then you eat something and it made you feel good. So you're like, okay, I like fruits or I like vegetables or whatever it is. And you can write about it and monitor yourself, okay? 
uh, working out a plan for change, devise an action program to bring about actual change. Five is evaluating any action plan to determine whether the goals are being achieved, adjust and revise and plan over. And again, it's always ongoing when it comes to treatment plans, because sometimes the things that you and your client talk about and suggest might not necessarily work. So you're going to change it. Multimodal therapy, clinical behavioral therapy, Arnold Lazarus is associated with this. It's comprehensive, which means that it covers a lot. It's systematic, there's a system to it, and it's a holistic approach. We want to pay attention to that person as a whole being, not just necessarily their problem. Uh, social concept theory and a uh, theory that applies diverse behavioral techniques to a wide range of problems. That's known as technical eclecticism, a diverse behavioral techniques to uh, a wide range of problems. So you use a bunch of different ways to work with this person, not necessarily just one type. You want to remember the the, uh, the key word basic ID, which if you look at this stands for behavior, affective responses, sensations, images, cognitions, interpersonal relationships, drug biological functions, nutrition, and exercise. So as a person who is in this specific multimodal uh, technique, you're going to pay attention to all these different things that this client is uh, showing in these different types of um, characteristics, okay? And then you're going to fully understand that person. The more coping responses a client learns in therapy, the less chance there is to a relapse. So let's say that they have unhealthy coping mechanisms. So one behavior that is considered unhealthy is drinking right, or doing drugs to make yourself feel a little bit better. So instead, we want to replace those with more positive behaviors. Maybe it's exercising or something like that, so that when they are um, tempted as a client to relapse, they will go, nope, I need to go exercise. I need to go take a run instead and see how that makes me feel. And hopefully that will calm them down if that's something that they have decided is effective. Mindfulness and acceptance-based content behavioral therapy. Mindfulness is being aware of our experiencing in a receptive way and then engaging in activity based on this non-judgmental awareness. So the key word when it comes to mindfulness is awareness, okay, being aware. You know that there are problems in your life, but you don't have to let it be just in front of your face the entire time. It could be off to the side and you can acknowledge that it's there, but there are other components in your life that is also worth living for. Okay, uh, clients train themselves to intentionally focus on the present and experience while at the same time achieving a distance from it. So you see it, you're aware of it, and you don't let it bother you all the time. You push it to the side, let it go a little bit further and say, you know, it's there. When there are problems that come, we'll deal with it. But if it's, you know, nothing important right now, then I'm going to take care of other business. Develop an attitude of curiosity and compassion to present experience, you know, um, now that we're focusing more on the here and now is appreciate that and see what life is about. Be curious about it. Focus on one thing at a time and to bring their attention back to the present moment. Again, sometimes people worry about things that happened in their past or people are really, really focused on what's going to happen in the future that they forgot that they're actually living right now. And so for this is to bring us back to the here and now. Acceptance, receiving one's present experience without judgment, but with curiosity and kindness and striving for full awareness of the present moment. So accepting what's going on now and appreciating um, that there are uh, times when things are going to be bad and then there are times that are good. We don't have to always live in the bad all the time. Active process of self-affirmation, again, to believe in yourself and to love yourself. So we talked a little bit about the four major approaches that are contemporary, the 2000s, remember, which are dialectical behavior therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and acceptance and commitment therapy. Okay, so the first one is dialectical behavior therapy. There are some major words here, so I just wanted to explain a little bit. Dialectical basically means having a conversation uh, between people, okay? And this is associated with Linehan. Blend of behavioral and psychoanalytic techniques for borderline personality disorder. Some of you guys do not know what borderline personality disorder is, so here is a link that you can read more about. But I just want to let you know that basically it's a mental illness marked by an ongoing pattern of varying moods, self-image, and behavior. 
These symptoms often result in an impulsive action and problems in relationships. People with borderline personality disorder may experience intense episodes of anger, depression, and anxiety that can last from a few hours to a few days. Okay. Psychotherapy relationship validation of the client etiological importance of the clients having experience in invalidating the environment as a child and confrontation uh, of resistance. So these are areas that you would want to discuss. Um, so one is the first one is basically the relationship between the counselor and the, and the client. Validation for the client. Let them know that these things are okay, that we see it, we're aware of it. Um, understand the etiological importance. That's a cause. What happened that caused this uh, feeling or these behaviors? Okay and be able to deal with it and confront with it. Uh, there are four sections. There's the mindfulness, which we already have talked about. There's also interpersonal effectiveness, learning to ask for what one needs or one, you know, asking for help and learning to cope with interpersonal conflict. Three, emotional regulation, identifying emotions, identifying obstacles to changing emotions, reducing that vulnerability feeling that they have and increasing positive emotions. And four, uh, distress tolerance, helping people to calmly recognize emotions associated with negative situations without becoming overwhelmed by these situations. Mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction, notion that much of our distress and suffering results from continually wanting things to be different from how they are now. Live in the present instead of ruminating about the past or overly concerned about the future. So sometimes we, basically are holding gripes, okay? Uh, and when we hold on to them, we can't really see what's going on right now. So what we're talking about is, don't think about what happened in the past, don't worry too much about the future, appreciate what's going on right now. Open yourself up, be aware, accept who you are with flaws and all, and uh, you'll be okay. And then hopefully from there, you can proceed to have healthier coping skills. Mindfulness-based training therapy, skills of mindfulness applied to depression, change clients' awareness of the relation of the negative thoughts and how to respond in skillful and intentional ways to their automatic negative thought patterns. Automatic negative thoughts, which we'll talk about more later on, uh, is basically those thoughts that we have immediately when someone tries to uh, give us a compliment or whatever usually is something negative, right? But it could also be positive too. So let's say that um, your teacher goes, hey, would you like to present with me? Because I think that you're a really good presenter. You are very well-spoken. And then you automatically go, no, I'm actually not very good. And the reason why you say that is maybe because of your parents or the people around you have let you know that maybe you're not a very good speaker or that's what you think. And so you hold on to those things as, as opposed to going, yeah, I'd love to do this uh, because uh, those automatic thoughts can sometimes be very destructive. All right, number one, identify negative thought and introduce mindfulness. Two, learn about the reactions that they have to life experiences and learn more about mindfulness. Three, teaching breathing techniques and focus attention on their present experiencing. Four, learning to experience the moment without becoming attached to outcomes as a way to prevent relapse. Five, how to accept their experiencing without holding on. Six, learn that they do not have to act on their thoughts. And seven, learn how to take care of themselves to prepare for relapse, to generalize their mindfulness practices to daily life. Again, these are the steps that a person, uh, when we deal with mindfulness, to be aware of and then to practice these things on a regular daily basis so that they can then um, use it in their lives effectively. Acceptance and commitment therapy, fully accepting present experience and mindfully letting go of obstacles. Acceptance is not merely tolerance. Uh, it is the act of non-judgment embracing, like a hug, of experience in the here and now. Not about changing the content of a person's thought. Emphasis on acceptance of cognition. So accept, hug, embrace yourself in all components, bad and good. Okay. The goal is to become aware and examine your thoughts, increase psychological flexibility. Know that there will be good days and then there will be bad days and that you have control over your life. You're not going to let those bad days take over and control everything. Okay. Uh, commitment, making mindfulness decisions about what is important in life and what the person is willing to do to live a value and meaningful life. 
multi um sorry behavioral therapy from a multicultural perspective so these are some of the strengths when it comes to behavioral therapy does not place emphasis on experiencing catharsis catharsis we talked about earlier is like that breakthrough like yes or oh my god i totally understand what we're talking about now or oh my goodness um that kind of like aha moment is catharsis. So it doesn't necessarily need to have that when it comes to behavioral therapy, because we're like, hey, what are the things that you're trying to change? And then we're just gonna try and change them. Stress is changing specific behaviors and developing problem solving skills. So what is the problem? Let's target it and then let's try to fall, uh, uh, fix it, okay? Uh, specificity basically means kind of being very exact or being very specific task orientation so it's all about doing the work focusing on the objectivity focus on the cognition and behavior action oriented which means that you're going to actually do things dealing with the present more than the past which is what's going on right now as opposed to ruminating and obsessing over what happened in our past emphasis on brief interventions usually it's what's the problem let's fix it and then let's move on with life teaching coping strategies and problem solving orientation. Shortcomings, so these are areas where they might see it as the haters um, are hating on behavioral therapy, is that fact that race, gender, ethnicity, and sexual orientation are critical variables that influence the process and the outcome. So those things actually do uh, sometimes alter what's gonna happen. Ideally, you would want things to be resolved as soon as possible, but sometimes oppression, discrimination will prolong those things. And so we need to address those things as well, okay? Therapists must pay attention to these factors and address social justice issues as they arise. So when there are people who talk about discrimination, you're gonna have to deal with it. You're gonna have to address it. Don't ignore it. Don't pretend like it doesn't exist. Talk about it with a client. If the focus is too much on the individual problem, it might not benefit them when they are in their social setting. So that might be because we're so we're talking about people who are so unique, um, it might not be able to be generalized, but sometimes it can be. Other people will say that you can. And that is it for this chapter. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you later. Bye.